welcome you all to our May Be Learning webinar presented by Alternative Ownership Advisors and brought to you by Be Local PDX. Uh, I'm Rose Lavelle. I'm the learning chair on the Be Local PDX board. I also work at Scout Books, another local B Corp. I just want a few things before we get started. Um, I'm going to drop it in the chat again is a link to a survey to help you get started thinking about ownership and governance of the company um, that you work for. So go ahead and fill that out now if you haven't. Um, we have a 50 minute presentation planned and then we'll have about 10, 15 minutes at the end for questions. Uh, but if you do have questions throughout the presentation, feel free to drop them in the chat and we will address them um, at the end. And please stay muted unless you are speaking. It will just be better listening for everybody. Um, a, we will be recording today's presentation and we'll have the recording, the slide deck, and any other resources available um, early by early next week on our website. We'll also be emailing everybody a copy of the recording too if you needed to review later. Uh, I also, I'll be posting a few more things into the chat. Um, if you're interested in speaking at a future event or know someone who is, I'm going to put a link for a request for proposals in there for future Be Learning events. We also have a link to sign up for the Be Local PDX newsletter. And if you just have any other questions at all, drop us a line, info at belocalpdx.com. So without further ado, I'd like to present our friends from Alternative Ownership Advisors, uh, Sarah Jonides and Natalie Reitman White. Uh, take it away, Natalie and Sarah, thank you. Okay, will do. Thank you, um, Rose, for having us today. We're very excited to be here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and load up this, this screen so you're going to see that um, here just in one second with our presentation. Are you seeing that right? We're just seeing the um the background. You're not seeing the, me sharing my screen? Oh yes, we see your screen, but it's okay, just yeah. the picture, yes. <laughs> okay, but it does say steward ownership at the top? No. Mm -mm. Um, okay, so maybe we should, we tested this on Natalie's computer and not on mine, I'm afraid. Um, it that. should, it shows that I'm sharing. Let's see. Okay. Hmm. I can go ahead and share it too if that's um, helpful. Um, well, it might. If, if you're not going to be able to see it, I guess that would have to be the case. I'm not sure why it wouldn't show. Is there something special you need to do in order to have it show what's on your screen? Uh, you usually have to pick which window you want it to, sh to share on the screen. So Okay, let me try one yeah. more time and see what it says. And in, the mean, folks, and in the meantime, folks. everyone who, while you're waiting, we have a quick survey just to get you thinking about ownership and governance um, at your company. So um, I'm gonna paste that in the chat and feel free to take a few minutes to fill that out. Okay, how's that look? It says uh, double click to enter full screen mode on our screen That's here. It's strange because I am on full screen mode. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, Goodness. Well, I'm happy to uh, jump in if you, if you want me to share my screen here. Try one more time. Same thing still? Same thing, yeah. Okay, well, <laughs> if that's not going to work, um, I think actually we're gonna have to have you run the slideshow then. Sure. Yeah. I'm not sure what else we can do to make that work. How does that look? Yes. There we go. Yes. Perfect. Is everybody seeing that now? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, sorry for that, folks. We uh, we thought we had this all worked out. Um, anyway, I am um, Sarah Jomitas, and um, I'm here with my um, colleague, Natalie Reitman White from um, Organically Grown Company. And um, I see the screen moving around a little bit. Are we 
Yeah, we we're all good. Things? Okay, great. I'll just say click. How about that when I'm ready to move? Okay, so we're really happy to be here. Natalie and I have been on this journey for quite a while um, now as social entrepreneurs, sustainability professionals and advocates. Um, and we've arrived at a place where we're focused on a topic of why ownership and finance matters as a key leverage point for cha the change we want to see in the world. So today, first of all, we're gonna hear a case study from Natalie about how she led organically grown companies transition to an alternative ownership structure. And then we'll talk about the emergence of these new corporate forms that social entrepreneurs are at the forefront of leading that are rethinking how businesses are owned, controlled, and capitalized to create greater prosperity and deeper impact. We'll also share the basic driving principles and building blocks behind these new ownership forms and relate other examples of companies beyond OGC. And we'll tie in how these new corporate forms can create deeper impact in the B-Lab categories, governance, workers, community, environment, and customers. And then finally, we'll share a little bit about the work we're doing um, at AOA to help others on their journey. Um, and so that's what the plan looks like for today. And now I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Natalie to talk about OGC's transition. And Rose, you can click. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, having us and thanks for joining. Um, so as Sarah said, um, she and I both have a background as social entrepreneurs and, and sustainability professionals. And we, we came to really care about this topic of ownership and finance and just wanted to kind of walk you through that journey there. Um, you know, I, I've uh, focused my career on working within the food system and uh, change towards sustainability with food businesses. And I'd say the early drivers for a lot of um, the businesses that I was working uh, with is how do we uh, transform food and agriculture to be healthier for people on the planet by farming differently, right? How do we uh, treat the soil differently, farm differently? I'd say the second wave of that movement has been how do we take that from not just farming differently and thinking about how we're treating the, the soil differently, but how do we bring those values into the entire business model and supply chain? So how are we thinking about the principles of regeneration versus extraction, um, the principles of, of balance, uh, equity, uh, fairness, um, transparency um, from not only the farm level, but into uh, the, the facilities that we're working in, um, our relationships with labor across the supply chain, um, our, the packaging that we use uh, for, for the, um, the food that we distribute, the energy that we're using. Um, so first thinking about it on you know, the products level, then thinking about it really in the holistic operations level. And part of what I've come to realize is there's this third level we need to be thinking about these principles, which is um, the, how our boardrooms um, and our corporations are shaped. Who's making the decisions and where does the money go? Um, and we really need to be thinking about moving those sustainability principles up into that level. Um, so, you know, what are the goals and the incentives that are driving our leadership's decision making? Is the focus still on driving for maximum quarterly earnings or is it about creating shared long-term prosperity across our supply chains? Um, what does a kind of regenerative return on investment look like if we're trying to uh, uh, produce products and services in a way that we think about the long-term impacts on people on the planet are the financing terms that we're signed up for um, and that the time horizons of those um, financing terms also aligned with um, those principles and, and the return profiles as well. So um, that's really been kind of an evolution in my journey from the what we produce to the how we produce it to the who makes the decisions and where does the money go and how does that also align across the system? So um, that's, that's where our journey has led us. So next slide. So I joined uh, Organically Grown Company in, in 2005. Um, Organically Grown uh, was formed 40 years ago. It's one of the largest distributors of organic fruits and vegetables in the country. And um, since OGC was formed, OGC has been continually kind of iterating its ownership and governance structure. So first click here. Uh, the first structure that Organically Grown took was as a uh, nonprofit. So uh, the group 
a, a group of people in Eugene got together and said, we really want to promote healthier food and agriculture. Uh, what can we do to provide infrastructure, education, and research? Quickly realized that the best way to uh, make change was not as a for-profit, but to actually help the farmers making a, make a living in shifting their practices towards organic practices. So went from a for-profit to an agricultural marketing cooperative owned by the growers to actually help the farmers um, share infrastructure, share trucks, share a sales force, um, coordinate production and get that production out to market. They would economically benefit. It would lead to more farmers changing their practices. Um, the third iteration was um, as we continued to grow, we realized that our success of the enterprise wasn't just due to the farmers, it was also due to the efforts of our staff, people who were um, involved in working on to develop development of organic standards, working on um, developing the organic market by convincing stores to buy the products. Um, all the workers that were in our facilities, picking up the produce and moving it every day, they were all part of creating the value. So we added on, um, employees into our ownership model and became a, an S Corp owned by farmers and employees. Grew and grew and grew. There was a limit to how many people we could have in the S Corp. And so we added on an employee stock ownership plan. Um, and when I came onto the board, I started seeing some clouds on the horizon with our ownership structure. So next slide. Um, so having an employee stock ownership plan uh, presented some challenges. W the first challenge that we found was um, if you're wanting to maintain your private status as a company and be owned by the people that work for you, you're going to have to self-finance your stock buyback from people who leave the company. So some of our founders were leaving the company, were having to buy back their stock in order to, to give it to employees, which is good but it can become a cash flow drain on using a lot of your profitability to, to do stack, stock buybacks versus other investments in the business. Um, the next thing that we found is um, administering a stock plan where you're continually recycling and transferring stock can be pretty administratively burdensome and, and complex with annual valuations and so forth. The third thing that we found was, um, Part of our success had always been considering multiple stakeholders' needs, not just the employees' needs. And when we were shifting more and more to just employee ownership, we found that some of the other voices weren't as present at the table. The farmers who had been a key part of our success, helping them be successful, had led to our success. And what about other voices like our community members who we serve, our customers and others? How do we have this, this balance of voices and really stay focused on our mission, which is transforming food and agriculture, not just driving stock value for retirement? Um, the third thing that, or the, I guess the fourth thing that we found um, was not everyone necessarily wants ownership as compensation. Some people are really into holding stock and, and holding voting and economic power. Some people would rather have uh, 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 profit sharing or some other mechanism. And it can kind of depend on the stage of life that you're at in your career, how long you plan to stay with the company, what, um, what your priorities are. Um, the, the, the last thing, which was our chief concern, um, was uh, as we were in an industry that was growing, as we were being successful, uh, there was the potential for someone to, or another company to come acquire our company. And with um, uh, folks holding stock, it could be a kind of temptation to cash in today on their shares. Um, and the new owner could potentially really take the business off of its track and off of its mission of transforming food and agriculture by supporting farmers, by reinvesting in um, mission and advocacy and so forth. So we were looking for a structure that would protect us uh, and from that and solve some of these other problems that I've talked about. So next slide. So I uh, brought this problem up to the board of directors and uh, the board turned to me and said, well, thanks for identifying this problem. Uh, would you lead a committee 
to, to deal with what do we do about it. So um, I uh, took on that responsibility. And the first thing that we um, uh, started to think about is, well, ideally, you know, we've already had several ownership structures. We've learned a lot from what, the, what they did for us and didn't. But ideally, we want any structure to align with what I call our, our head and our heart. So um, there's a few animations here. Just go ahead and click rows. Um, so the first one is um, uh, your ownership structure has to align with why you exist and what is the vision of impact that you seek in the world. And your structure has to support that. The second is your ownership structure has to align with the the way you want to make about that change in the world how you want to operate um, what are the things with how your company operates that makes you unique and special how people lead in your company how you make decisions who you include in those decisions who you share rewards with so your ownership structure has to support the why you exist and the how you want to operate from a heart perspective and be really aligned with that it also has to support um, your strategy. So what is your competitive game plan of the products and services that you're going to offer that people uh, will, will pay for so that your company can grow and be successful? And what are the resources that you need to carry out that competitive game plan? Um, and then the, the, the fourth is um, financial resiliency. So this notion that there is no mission unless your company is financially viable and healthy. So what are the cash flows that you need to reward the contributors to your business, to make sure that you have financial health and resiliency, to carry out your mission through your products and services. And I think this framework is really important because um, with the ownership structure, you're always looking at optimizing all of these things. If you have an ownership structure that totally works for your heart, your uh, really reflects your culture, but provides you not enough resources to um, carry out your business, that's a problem. On the flip side, if it's only focused on kind of the, the financial uh, pra practicality, then it's not really thinking about um, how you're balancing decision-making and rewards with the people who are driving your business, then that's a problem too. So um, we find this framework to be very helpful. So next slide. So uh, along the process of evaluating structures, at its core, we discovered some things that were really important to us. One is we really see business as a vehicle for change. And at its heart, most conventional business models, in fact, focus on shareholder returns and short-term profits um, versus viewing their businesses as vehicles for positive change in the world. And so that view of kind of shareholder primacy and focus on short-term returns and driving share value has actually created a lot of unintended consequences. And we don't want to replicate that in whatever ownership model we take on. Um, and this slide, this next slide talks about the shareholder primacy logic that most conventional ownership structures have in their DNA today. So it's, it's not uh, that people aren't well-meaning, it's that the structures in their DNA replicate the shareholder primacy doctrine in their governance, how the governance is set up, how their legal and fiduciary responsibilities for their board and officers is set up, and even the financing terms that they might sign up for with it, investors and others. And so some of those kind of core logics are here on the left um, that you can see. So then if we click one more over, well, these are some of the results that happens of that, that core logic. So let's look at, for example, social entrepreneurs need money to grow their businesses and get their businesses off the ground and grow their impact. So their options might be to go to public markets um, for investment. And now they're signed up for a structure that really focuses on quarterly earnings um, and uh, drive for returns. Or they might go to private um, equity or venture capital who says, you know, 
they, they have this long-term mission, but they're interested in a three to five year return uh, window that's going to push uh, a sale of the company in three to five years, which might be not aligned with what that social entrepreneur envisions in terms of their company being a vehicle for, for long-term change and impact. Um, same thing with control and decision-making. So as founders bring in investors, um, uh, decisions can potentially be made further and further away from the people who are actually doing the work in companies um, and uh, who are con this and who are connected to the stakeholders in those companies um, so it's can kind of become easy to abstract a number of we want to drive a certain amount of growth or a certain amount of uh, uh, profitability that is abstracted from how that number is playing out on the stakeholders and the business's ability to sustain and, and survive and thrive. So essentially ownership equals control. And every time you have ownership changes, kind of the steering wheel of what your company's focused on can change. So um, what do we do about it? Um, next slide. Well, we have to, our, our, belief is that we have to get away from the structural DNA of current ownership models and actually rethink and redesign ownership governance and finance for, to, to have different impacts. Um, and steward ownership represents a different way of thinking about ownership. It actually shifts the structures, goals, and incentives that drive companies and thus creates different outcomes. So what is steward ownership? So steward ownership is not new. There are actually historic examples of steward ownership structures, and then there are emerging contemporary examples. And the way that the ownership structure is codified can take several different forms, but there are some common uh, key principles across all steward ownership forms. And um, those are, are listed here. So go ahead and just pull them up, Rose. Um, so the two principles are first profits uh, serve purpose and self-governance. So the first one, profits are not viewed in an as an end in themselves they're viewed as a, a means to an end of creating change through the products and, or creating value through the products and services that you offer so profits are essentially used to support a company's mission and the mission is the ends that you're trying to achieve um, and and profits are a means to that end um, but profits are primarily used to reinvest in the business reinvest in the mission and they can also be used to pay back founders, pay back capital providers and investors, and shared with other stakeholders. But that's not the driver, that's kind of a, a, a part of what we need to reward in the system. But ultimately those profits should primarily be directed towards mission. The second principle of, of in steward ownership models that, that steward uh, owned companies follow is um, this principle of self-governance that decision-making in companies should really be kept close to those people who are actually uh, delivering on the mission every day. So the people who are actually carrying out um, the, the business's mission through their work. Uh, in OGC's case, it's uh, the people who are running the company every day, interacting with our coworkers, our coworkers who are out in the field meeting with growers, interacting with the, the retailers that we do business with. Those people are close to the health of all those stakeholders. They're close to the needs of all those stakeholders. They're constantly adjusting our products and services and responsiveness as a business to be able to serve them. So those folks should really be in charge of kind of the steering wheel of the company and adjusting what we're doing as a business to carry out our mission every day. Um, so those are the fundamental principles of steward ownership. Governance should make, be close to the company and profit should primarily be reinvested in the company. So uh, next slide here. 
So by centering business design around these two core principles, steward ownership shifts the paradigm and the incentives that drive corporate behavior. And this slide shows uh, some of the differences. Okay, so we've been talking about principles. I'd like to get into a practical example of what a steward ownership structure looks like. So click the next slide. Uh, next, next, there you go. So the structure that OGC landed on uh, is called a perpetual purpose trust. So we um, bought back our shares from our S corporation and ESOP and moved them into a, a perpetual purpose trust. Uh, next slide. And uh, what we found is there's been a whirlwind of interest in this model. And so we are um, now sharing this model with others. And part of why we've started Alternative Ownership Advisors is we find a lot of uh, entrepreneurs and investors are feeling similarly looking at kind of the conventional shareholder primacy um, uh, doctrine and saying, there's something wrong here with this. It's not creating widespread prosperity. It's creating prosperity for a few. Uh, it's, it's, you know, driving some of these environmental outcomes we don't want. How do we use social enterprise as a vehicle for change, but make sure we're structuring it differently so the outcomes are different? Um, so next slide. So let's talk about the nuts and bolts of what um, a steward ownership structure is. Um, so in a traditional ownership structure, uh, and let's see here, go ahead and click uh, two times, there we go, okay. So in a traditional ownership structure, shareholders um, own and control the company, uh, and the company is responsible with benefiting the shareholders. So what does that mean? Essentially, the shareholders have both economic and governance rights. So governance, they often sit on the board of directors or they elect the board of directors. They have control over the board and the decision making. And economic rights, um, they're the ones who typically receive the dividends from the company, so the profits that are generated. And at the end of the day, the enterprise value, the value that's created in the company is held by them. So they own the company as their private property and they are, uh, they can sell the company uh, to uh, another uh, share, you know, another shareholder, another owner, if they want. Um, and in the uh, more socially progressive structures, there's this dotted line over to stakeholders. So they might um, choose to share some of the governance and uh, economic uh, rights and returns with stakeholders but they might not, right? Uh, the degree to which they, they might say do profit sharing, which is dividend sharing with employees or other stakeholders or the community is, is really discretionary. Um, the amount of, of governance they might share is really discretionary. So the traditional model, you know, shareholders own and control to their benefit and there might be some sharing. And shareholders um, pass on shareholding in two main ways. They either do it through selling ownership uh, or um, inheritance. Those are the two ways that ownership is transferred. So let's go to the next slide. So in a steward ownership structure, you change the paradigm. So, um, and bear with me first. Okay, so um, let's see here. Let's click two more clicks. Sorry, I'm trying to line up my slide with. Okay, so the first, in a steward ownership structure, um, in, in OGC steward ownership structure, we created a trust that now owns organically grown company. And the trust owns o organically grown company to the benefit of the mission and stakeholders. Um, let's go a few more clicks here. Okay, so, oops, let's go back. So it follows the steward ownership principle around self-governance in that the trust uh, will is a shareholder 
that will never die, never wants to liquidate, never wants to extract a profit. It's simply a vehicle for holding ownership in stewardship into perpetuity. So there will never be a change of control again. Um, so who governs the company? Um, in our case, those who are close to the company govern the company. So we have a, a, a board of directors that is elected um, by our um, trust protector committee and the trust protector committee represents our stakeholders, which are farmers, employees, community members, um, investors, and uh, customers. So our stakeholder groups that um, are part of our company um, elect the trust and the trust holds the company into perpetuity, which protects our independence. We're not for sale. The trust will never sell us. And we're governed by a merit-based group of stewards who have been elected as those who are close to the mission and um, have leadership capabilities to ensure the company and the board performs to the mission long-term. Um, so that's, who, that's how decision-making uh, is held in, in self-governance and how um, the company is kept independent. So what about the money? Where does the money go? If you have a stockholder that never wants a profit and never wants to um, sell the company, the company is still economically viable, still generating um, profit. So where does that go? Well, it essentially gets reinvested back in the company, back in the mission, and get shared with stakeholders as we go. So um, we uh, have a way for the company to uh, cash flow waterfall, share with employees a portion of the profit sharing, share with customers, community, and farmers through investments and in things that benefit them. And we also have the ability to raise capital from mission aligned investors, and they get a portion of the income flow without selling them control and the ability to sell the company over time. Um, so they are partners, they're an important part of making the company be successful by capitalizing the company. But again, they just share in a portion of the income flows and not the ability to sell it. Okay. So it's not just OGC who has done a structure like this. If we go to the next slide. Um, here are some examples. So another model of stewardship ownership besides trust ownership is something called a golden share. Um, and in a golden share model, here's some examples of companies that are golden shares. Um, essentially, uh, it does the same thing. Independence is protected. So there is a veto share called the golden share that um, makes it so that the company can never be sold. Independence is permanently protected. And in these models, you um, assign um, voting rights or governance rights to merit-based stewards who are working in the company and close to the company mission, maybe those who are impacted by the mission like the suppliers or um, the customers. And economic rights, um, then uh, a portion of the income of the company can be designated to founders, to pay back founders for their early efforts, can be designated to um, employees, or in some of these models, um, for example, Ecosia, 100% uh, of the economic rights is actually shared with the community um, through a nonprofit um, foundation. So Ecosia is not for sale, the governance is held in stewardship, and as it's profitable, those profits um, uh, go out to the community. Um, another stewardship structure um, is a, probably one you might be a little bit more familiar with is a foundation structure. It's actually pr pretty similar to the trust structure. The companies are not for sale. They're held in, in a foundation versus a trust. Um, and the, the um, uh, profits are designated either to charitable causes like Newman's own 100% charity, or again, to a combination of founders, family members that started a company like Bosch, and um, employees or others. Um, also, two more clicks here. Um, there's variations on purpose trusts. Um, OGCs is very multi-stakeholder in that we include five different groups. Um, some stewardship trusts can be just focused on one stakeholder group. Um, Metis Construction and, and California Harvesters are examples of 
um, trusts that um, the economic rights are primarily reinvested in the company and shared with the workers. Very simple type of trust. Um, and cooperatives can also be steward owned as long as they do have that a veto share, that golden share, which prevents against demutualization of the co-op and a sale of the co-op for the private gain of the cooperative members to a larger conglomerate. Okay, next slide. So um, because there are historic and contemporary examples, scholars have been studying the impacts of companies that are, um, that embed these principles in their ownership structures and these are some of the impacts that are proven so um, the first is these structures permanently lock in mission there's no longer a, a, a fear or a uncertainty that there might be a change of control and a new owner might say actually this company exists for this different purpose and we're going to you know pull the steering wheel this direction that it's clear in all these models that the company is not for sale and control uh, is not for sale. The second is, um, it, again, what I was just saying, protects from acquisition and um, uh, consolidation. The third is that you find higher levels of employee satisfaction, lower attrition rates, um, higher job description, uh, security and representation of employees in um, governance, which results in, in fairer pay, better benefits. Um, next, steward ownership companies, because they're not spending so much money on dealing with constant share transferring and ownership transitions, and they know what their mission is long term, are actually in position to really focus a lot of their resources back on reinvesting in the company and research and development and um, things that will progress their mission, which leads to higher levels of, of innovation. Um, last, there's a certain amount of built-in financial uh, resiliency in steward-owned um, companies. Um, uh, there's some historical evidence that they're more likely to survive downturns than um, conventionally owned companies because of the high degree of loyalty and commitment that their workers have, their customers have, because they're very clear on what their mission is and why they exist and who they exist to serve. Okay, next slide. So now I'm going to hand this over to Sarah to talk about how these structures um, uh, overlap and, and support um, what uh, benefit corporation um, um, is, is trying to achieve and the B impact assessment in particular. Okay, thanks, Natalie. Um, so for those of you um, joining us today that either own or work in a certified B Corp, we know you already likely embrace the movement towards stakeholder capitalism and welcome the opportunity for companies to deepen their commitment to mission and purpose and engage and empower stakeholders. Philosophically, there's a clear and strong alignment between B Corp principles and steward ownership principles. So what I want to highlight here is the interplay and overlap between steward ownership principles and the metrics and actions measured by the B impact assessment. Rose, if you want to go to the next slide. And you can just click once more. Thank you. So specifically in the governance category, since, as Natalie said, there will never be another ownership change when you have a steward ownership model. So therefore, the mission is securely locked. There is no drive to increase share value specifically in preparation for an exit, and this enables the board to be free and clear in acting in their fiduciary duty in a way that balances purpose and profits for the long-term health of the business. Additionally, the makeup of the governance bodies shifts in steward-owned companies to put the voting rights into the hands of stewards, as Natalie said, so there's a broader representation generally of stakeholders besides financial investors, and this also improves accountability and trans, uh, transparency. For the other categories, workers, environment, customers, et cetera, the interplay with a steward ownership company will generally depend on how the stakeholders are codified um, and economic rewards and governance are designed. 
So in the workers category, for instance, if steward ownership design is specifically intended to um, be for employee benefits, such as an employee benefit trust or worker cooperative, there's usually an intentional focus on funneling the profits of the business back into compensation and benefits. Other steward ownership structures like the ones Natalie mentioned, such as gold and share model, can allow for true ownership participation um, through non-voting equity shares. Those could either be given as grants to employees, maybe during the transition, or um, potentially um, providing access for employees to buy into shares over time. Natalie also touched on a couple of examples of um, steward ownership examples that are worker focused. So Metis Construction and California Harvesters were the two that she mentioned that created employee um, benefit trusts specifically to support those um, employees. In the community category, again, similar to workers, if the steward ownership design is structured to benefit um, your suppliers, vendors, or local community members, then the profits of the business are generally earmarked for things like donations and supplier, um, uh, fun, fun, some, some sort of funds for suppliers um, to support them as well. These stakeholders could potentially participate in governance, um, either through electing board members or perhaps having a seat themselves at the table as a stakeholder um, director. Our parent company, OGC, which you've been hearing a lot about, is a really great example of this type of um, uh, structure because their per the, the perpetual purpose trust here is designed to um, benefit the purpose in, in support of five stakeholder groups, as Natalie mentioned. So in addition to your investors um, and your staff, which are oftentimes your, your primary, the, it also brings in customers and community allies and growers. And so in this situation, as she mentioned, a portion of the economic rewards are reserved for qualified stakeholders from these groups. And all the stakeholders in this group have the opportunity to elect the Trust Protector Committee, which in turn hires the Board of Directors. When it comes to the environment, same situation. <clears throat> steward ownership can be designed to ensure that the company's profits can be reinvested in environmental stewardship. Natalie brought up the example of Ecosia, which is a great example. They are an alternative search engine and they let users plant trees by searching the web and they donate 80% of their surplus revenue. And so far um, they've raised over $3 million for reforestation pro um, projects since they were founded. They use a golden share model, as she mentioned, and you may have heard of them because they were actually Germany's first certified B Corp. Let's go ahead and go to the um, next slide, Rose. So there are a number of um, certified B Corp companies like Ecosia who have um, taken steps to fully adopt um, steward ownership. And you can click once more. Um, so in doing so, somebody like an Ecosia has a really locked in mission and permanent independence never to be sold again, which is kind of the, the ideal from a steward ownership perspective, right? But Many companies we talk to and many folks, um, owners, founders, executives we talk to um, are very interested and have uh, alignment with the principles of steward ownership, but they may not be willing or ready yet to take the leap to adopt a new ownership structure. But there are steps that companies can take to move towards steward ownership gradually. So if you click to the next, a good first step is codifying the purpose for which a company exists and the stakeholder groups who benefit from that purpose. As I said before, you know, B Corps by definition are purpose driven and have a multi stakeholder approach and culture. However, companies, you'd be surprised, companies don't always take the time to formally codify their purpose and ensure that all their stakeholders understand the role they play and how they benefit from the ongoing operation of the business. And codifying these and sharing these broadly can help ensure there isn't mission drift over time or that the social or environmental program commitments that have been made become eliminated because it's obviously much harder to walk away from promises that have been made publicly. You can go ahead and click one more time. Another step you could take is to designate specific voting rights um, or shares among a broader set of stakeholders beyond just your um, shareholders and executives who normally hold those rights. 
So for example, um, the makeup of the board of directors could be expanded to include representatives from their stakeholder groups, from folks like their staff, their suppliers, vendors, community members, and allies, et cetera. Um, or the stakeholders could be given a right to potentially elect one of the board seats, maybe one board seat set aside that they could elect, or at the very least, they could have an opportunity to attend maybe an annual shareholder meeting to in encourage that sort of transparency and accountability that we all um, appreciate. Click to the next. A company could also choose to designate um, specific economic rights or shares more broadly to a group of stakeholders beyond their shareholders. So an example might be something called um, a cash flow waterfall. And this defines which stakeholders can receive economic rewards after sufficient profits have been reinvested in the business and the debt and equity obligations have been met. Um, therefore, this makes them codified versus discretionary. And this is something that OGC has used quite successfully, but even without a steward ownership structure, you could use um, uh, in a company. Another alternative, and there are a number of different ways you can think about economic rights, but another alternative that's, that's gaining in popularity is that stakeholders um, could be gifted equity shares um, or have an opportunity to buy in, as we mentioned before, and the shares could be dividend based and they would deliver a consistent yearly return and not be dependent on a, uh, a return, uh, a terminal return associated with an eventual sale of the business. Finally, to the last point, um, owners and leaders could work with existing or new investors to structure terms that are focused on a longer time horizon and that aren't tied to the eventual sale of the business. So, for example, when companies are looking for growth capital, instead of pursuing conventional equity, uh, private equity, or venture capital, um, companies could um, consider evergreen funds. And these are permanent capital vehicles that are focused on long-term appreciation for investors. These are open-ended funds, um, so no set termination date, and they're designed to pay back investors without the pressure to um, exit the underlying assets of the company. Or they could look at structuring a revenue or royalty-based investment with a capped return, which incentivizes healthy growth versus driving profits to an eventual sale. Go ahead and click to the next verse. So supporting companies on their journey as they move towards steward ownership is why Alternative Ownership um, Advisors was formed. We help leaders of private companies design and implement ownership and investment solutions that align with mission, accelerate impact, and protect independence. So that journey might look like a founder who's getting ready to retire and wanting to transition their company into, and thinks of steward ownership as a way to do that to achieve both liquidity and legacy. It might also look like a group of owners and leaders coming together and deciding that a steward ownership structure is the best way to support the company's future, its mission, its culture, its business strategy, and its cash management needs. Or it might be um, an owner wanting to take um, on investment to fuel growth, but not wanting to lose control or sell out. On to the next slide, please. So at AOA, we help companies by providing customized end-to-end -end consulting services, and this includes finance and capitalization strategy, ownership and governance design, road mapping and implementation support, financing and fundraising, as well as change management support, which is so critical to enhance the custom, uh, company's brand position um, and deepen the engagement with employees and customer as part of your ownership transition. So on the next page, for folks learning, wanting to learn more about steward ownership, there's really a multitude of great resources available. Um, and so we shared some of those here. And the first thing that I want to um, turn your attention to is um, an organization called Purpose Foundation. They are the preeminent authority supporting a global community of businesses and entrepreneurs on their path to steward ownership. Through research, uh, research, excuse me, open source, resource development, hands-on support and investment, Purpose is building an ecosystem necessary to make steward ownership and alternative financing accessible, much in the same way that B-Lab built a global movement for people using business as a force for good. 
And to fuel the adoption of these um, steward ownership principles, they have also compiled a great um, toolkit of resources, which is noted here. We've also included the links to a couple of our favorite blog posts that use OGC as a case study to highlight how governance and finance works um, in a steward owned company. And of course, you're always welcome to, um, to visit our FAQs on our website, which um, we think are chock full of a lot of helpful information. So um, thank you very much for being here today. We're gonna go ahead and switch over to um, the Q&A, um, which will be led by Rose. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. I learned a lot. Um, I did, didn't see any questions posted in the chat. So if anyone has any, feel free. Now's the time to kind of call them out or type them in the chat and I can call them out for you. I have a question. Yes, go for it. Hi, my name is Devin Nevius. Uh, I'm the owner or one of two owners and CEO of Upward Technology. We're a B Corp in Portland. I apologize, mm -hmm. there's some background noise in my house. Um, I had a question. First of all, thank you very much, Natalie. That was really interesting and uh, learned a lot about that. It's a fascinating journey uh, you've been on. I, my question was actually going to sound like a like a ruthless capitalist question, but for an an owner and um, someone who's taking a business from you know nothing to what it is, I, I would eventually like to have a liquidity event. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm wondering what kind of dilution of value this sort of a, a structure brings or is there a way to structure it where there can still be a full value or a close to full value liquidity event um, and still fulfill the long-term missions that you laid out good question so um in ogc's case since we were dealing with an employee stock ownership plan we actually had to do a fair market valuation in order to get set the price at which we were going to buy back the shares and transfer them to a trust um, you know, I think in a lot of stewardship situations, it's more about less about fair market valuation because you could go sell your company to the highest bidder, but that's not why you're doing this, right? You're doing this because you want to make sure that the company continues to operate with the mission and values that you founded it because you feel a responsibility on going to your, uh, the folks that you do business with, the folks that work for you. So, um, in that sense, you're really setting a price that's based on um what you feel you've put in in terms of sweat equity and what you need for your retirement or you know your next thing and balancing that with um uh what can the company afford to pay me to self-fund me out and um you know is there a discount involved because i'm not going to the highest bidder but i'm keeping this legacy intact so it's that um really thinking it through and that's actually one of the things that we help people think through uh, what do you really need what is fair what can the business sustain um, it to to buy you out and so there there is that financing that needs to happen to go to provide you the liquidity so in some cases it can be the seller transfers their common stock to a stewardship trust and the company pays them back via a note right so it's a, a a buyback over time it could be that you sell the majority of your company into a steward ownership model and um, the rest of uh, that gets uh, taken out over time um, through debt so it could be like a, a partial transition that happens slowly or an all at once through a note so a leveraged buyout um, or there are ways to raise external equity um, to provide you liquidity, um, but it's non-control, non-voting or low voting stock. So again, that separation, you're not selling um, economic and governance rights combined. You'd be selling economic rights and the economic rights that you'd be selling uh, to investors would not be tied to an eventual sale of the business. So some other way um, to pay back investors and eventually redeem those shares like OGC issued preferred stock there's a dividend based return that's a portion of the income flows that investors get among other stakeholders. And um, the shares are designed to be held long term, but if investors do want redemption, they can request redemption and it happens over a period of time. And it's not tied to the trust needing to liquidate the company to pay them back. Does that help? Any more questions on that front? Follow up questions? No, that was really thorough. Thank you. That's great. 
Oh, one other quick question is, have you read Prosperity by Colin Mayer? Uh, I have not read Prosperity, but I've read some of Colin Mayer's work and um, he was actually one of the keynotes at uh, uh, inaugural stewardship ownership uh, conference I went to in Berlin. Um, but cool. I love his work. I mean, this is a lot of this is centered around what he's been preaching. So people who don't know Colin Mayer, he's one of the deans of a business school, I think at Oxford. Oxford, correct? Oxford. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, he says this notion that shareholder, that companies exist primarily to drive value for shareholders is just one way to think about a corporation. And it's probably an unhealthy way to think about a corporation. A better way to think about a corporation would be a corporation exists to deliver value to society through its products and services. And as part of that, it's going to generate a profit and the profit should primarily be used to reinvest in creating more value and shared with the, the sweat equity of founders who created these businesses and people who are contributing along the way. But it, it you know, the, there's, there's a different way to think about why corporations exist um, than, than the current doctrine. And, um, uh, you know, we, we need to shift our thinking as a lot of what he advocates. Would, would you ag agree, Devin? Anything to add? Yes. No, that's good. I'm, I'm just getting into the book. I'm probably two chapters in to Prosperity, which is his most recent kind of thesis on the whole thing. And it's, it's all about uh, the Friedman model where the purpose of a business is to drive shareholder value is, is very outdated and outmoded. And um, the, the gap to adopt this new model is actually not that big. It's not that big of a leap. It's more of a mental leap than it is a structural leap. Mm -hmm. And I would argue it's both, right? Because we make the mental shift, but we actually have models that are built on an old design logic and we need new models. And they don't have to be complicated. These stewardship ownership forms, they, corp corporations are still running and acting like they did before. We're just shifting that they're not for sale long-term and um, we're keeping governance internal so that it doesn't get farther and farther away. And we're also ensuring that the rewards get reinvested and shared over time. We're locking that in. Great, thanks Devin, thanks Natalie. Um, just wanted to mention that I did drop uh, Sarah and Natalie's emails in the chat. So if you do have additional questions after today and wanna get in touch, that's a great way to get in touch with them. Um, are there any other questions? Or comments? We did have a comment. This is so inspiring in the chat, so I just want to point that out. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess uh, if there's no other questions, we'll, um, we'll wrap up unless uh, did anyone else? Let's see. Someone just. Uh, Rian, did you have a question? I saw you pop up on video there. No, not particularly. Oh, okay. I just, just double check in. <laughs> yeah, he's very helpful. I, I guess I have another question, yeah. uh, not to okay. steal the. Uh, so, in terms of resources for supporting these kinds of transactions, are there any particular legal firms or consultancies that have a specialty built around this? So, it's a. Uh, an ecosystem that is just getting started. So I, um, Sarah mentioned earlier, um, uh, Purpose is a is a um, organization that is trying to help support the ecosystem developing. So kind of like the early days of B Lab, where B Lab formed, and now there are uh, lots of consultants who can help you get ready for B Lab certification and can help you audit your practices. Um, uh, there, there's kind of a growing ecosystem, and and now there's lawyers that that can help you with putting benefit corporation into your um, uh, bylaws um, and articles. Uh, there's a growing ecosystem of folks working on steward ownership. So for example, that's why we started AOA because we realized that having gone through OGC's transaction, we learned a lot in the process and we understand what it's like for peer companies. So we can actually help founders and board members think this through and, and think through the financing and the structure. Um, but there are others and there's also, I'd say um, at this point, 
half a dozen different law firms that we know of that are helping people work through the technical aspects of the structure. One of the things I share with folks is uh, you kind of want to bring in the lawyer when after you work through the process of thinking through codify, codifying the purpose, the stakeholders, what your timeline is for transition as a founder, you kind of work through those things. And then you bring in a lawyer to say, okay, which stewardship structure matches this? Um, and how would we go about that? And um, so uh, that's kind of the, the ecosystem that I'd say is developing. Um, Sarah, would you add? No, I think you got it. I mean, I think to your point that whenever folks are thinking about um, a transition strategy specifically, there's generally, a, you generally have sort of a cadre of people that you touch in with, whether or not that's your, your lawyer, your CPA, your wealth management person, there's a lot of different people. Um, we serve as one of those people that can help guide the process. Um, and generally, you're going to need a, a number of different people to support you. And I think it's always good to, to potentially have one point person in that group that kind of helps lead and project manage to take some of the weight off of the, of the, the, the owner because you have a business to run. Um, and these are big weighty things and big decisions. So it's, it's good to have somebody that can help you lead point. Um, um, and so somebody that has a, a broad base of experience around um, steward ownership and an understanding of the financing side and, and the governance structure side is really important. The other thing Thanks, I wanna, Sarah. Yeah, the other thing I want to add is um, uh, there's a growing ecosystem of investors who are interested in these structures. So there's like the world of impact investors is also maturing. So first it was, hey, we want to invest in companies that are doing the what differently. So let's get out of fossil fuels and get into renewable energy. And then they're like, hey, we should be thinking about the how of companies are doing them. How are they run and um, how are they treating their, their stakeholders and folks along the way? And now some of them are starting to think about their role. Well, let's look at the how we're investing. Are we investing on the right time horizons? Are we investing with the right expectations? Like if our investment is predicated on a big exit for the company, how might that actually erode our impact that we're trying to create over time? So there's also kind of this growing network and ecosystem of investors that this can actually attract because they're looking for companies that are being thoughtful, not in just the, the what they're doing, but how that impact will be stewarded and sustained long-term and not turn over when the founder changes. Great. All right. So, see, I think that's that might be it. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap up and thank everyone for coming. And thank, thank you very you, much. Sarah. Thank you, Natalie, for your time and teaching us some more. And um, yeah, yeah. looking forward to uh, digging into those resources that you shared and, and learning more about the process. So thank, thank you. you. And well, thanks, thanks for good. coming to our Be Learning Lunch. We'll hope to see you at the next one. Sounds right. good. Thank, thank you. Everybody. Everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Good afternoon.